Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here. I think we have pretty much a full house, about 13, 1,400 people here joining in person in San Francisco. And welcome to the other, I think, 11, 12,000 people joining us for the live stream as well. Super excited to be here. Uh, obviously, it's, uh, it's been a few years since we've actually done HashiConf back in San Francisco, and uh, this is a home for us. We sort of started here, and our, our HQ is not, not even two blocks away. So super excited to be here and excited to have all of you here. We have a packed agenda, so I don't want to waste any time sort of jumping right into it. I think, uh, you know, obviously for many, many years, we've talked about the products, we've built out more and more tools over time, but, you know, taking a step back, the challenge we've always looked to solve has been kind of the same one, right? It's been really looking at how do we enable our application teams to build and deliver applications you know, across a multi-cloud estate, and at the same time acknowledge the role of our platform and security teams as they're supporting the underpinning shared services that let us do this, right? So then when we think about the HashiCorp focus, it's ultimately been in two areas, right? As we think about the role of platform teams, it's how do we provide that set of shared infrastructure lifecycle management for provisioning, deploying, managing the life cycle of an application. And at the same time, there's the set of security challenges. How do we distribute secrets and keys, broker access between people, machines, different services? So ultimately, we think about it as two sets of problems. One is how do we enable the workflows and the automation around each of those? And then two is what's the full life cycle? It's not just day one provision. It's a whole day two, day three, day four administration of these things. And so for us, obviously, it sounds maybe like two simple categories. Of course, there's many different tasks to be done. And so that results in a, a relatively broad portfolio of products. So we're going to share a bunch of updates across all of these products today. So I want to start by focusing in on the set of security products. Right? These include Vault, Boundary, and Console. Probably our most well-known, probably the first tool we released in the security portfolio is Vault, and the focus there has always been an identity-based approach to secret management, right? When we say secret management, that's a broad array of things. It could be usernames and passwords, it could be certificates, TLS keys, you know, it could be encryption keys, and then ultimately gets into how do I actually protect data at rest, data in transit, right? Because ultimately that becomes about key management and, and cryptography as well. So we've been very, very busy uh, in Vault land. There's a whole lot of innovations that we've delivered. I'm not going to have time to talk about all of these pieces, but we will have deep dives today and tomorrow, so I encourage you to go check those out. I do want to highlight a few of these, though. The first one I want to spend some time talking about is HCP Vault Secrets. We announced this service earlier this year over the summer at Hashi Days. And the goal was really to bring a multi-tenanted cloud-native solution to secret management, to HCP. The goal was how do we get quickly up and running to have a secret management solution where we don't have to think about managing a cluster, or thinking about scaling it, and it's really much more of sort of a, a SaaS-type experience. So this launched in public beta over the summer. Since then, we've had over a million secret accesses. We've had hundreds of different organizations sign up and thousands of applications connected and received great feedback from customers. One quote I really wanted to share here is from Alex at New Relic. Uh, and what he sort of shared is that you know, using the service made him feel like a secret wizard, right? From starting to being able to actually deploy to production and consume the secrets in less than 30 minutes. And that's exactly the type of experience we want to deliver. So today, super excited to announce that we're taking this service generally available. So just to get started and get going quickly with it, there is a free tier available as well. So you can sign up today for HCP, log in, and get going. You can create your first set of applications, onboard your first set of 25 secrets, and do 10,000 API calls a month as part of the free tier. Uh, and then there's more tiers above that as well. There's a deep dive on this later on as part of uh, day two, so take a look at that. But I wanted to give a quick preview of what does this actually look like right? for those who haven't yet played with the beta. Here we can see when we log into the overview page, we get a list of our various applications. From there, we can drill into each application and define a set of secrets for it. And then for each secret, we get a versioned history. So as we evolve it, rotate the secret, we can see the previous versions as well. Now, being able to define all the secrets and manage them centrally is one goal. But I think one of the things we've acknowledged is that secrets ultimately end up living in multiple places and getting consumed in multiple places. 
So one of the capabilities we're super excited about is what we're calling secret sync. What this lets you do is define a secret in HashiCorp Vault Secrets, but then synchronize it to multiple external systems. This could be AWS Secret Manager, it could be Azure Key Vault, it could be GCP Secret Manager, GitHub Actions, Vercel, the list goes on. The goal, and I think the realization, is that ultimately you might have platform native capabilities that only understand the local secret manager, right? So it might be a service in Amazon that only understands AWS Secret Manager. But you don't want to have to define and manage a secret in multiple places, do rotation in multiple places, have to audit that and do change management. So what this lets you do is define everything in one place, treat Vault as your system of record, and then synchronize that everywhere. So if I rotate the key in Vault, it rotates everywhere, right? So we're super excited about this. We've already received great feedback about users who have been piloting it. And we're bringing this capability not just to HCP, but as well to Vault Enterprise as part of 1.15. And that's available in beta in 1.15 now. Now, when we think about the core use case of where people start with Vault, it tends to be just putting secrets into it that the applications are consuming. One of the most common types of secrets we end up seeing is actual encryption keys, right? These keys are being used to you know, sign sessions, to encrypt data, to ensure the authenticity of a transaction. But I think one of the most challenging things is the moment one of these encryption keys leaves Vault, you sort of have to trust the applications are handling it correctly. So one of the things we really look at is how can Vault be used as a key manager such that the keys never actually have to leave Vault. This is part of what we refer to as sort of the advanced data protection types of patterns, right? So really looking at how do I go beyond just the secret to protecting the actual data at rest and in transit between various systems. One of the key use cases for this becomes encryption, right? So an application might get credit card number, social security, other PII. It can use Vault and say, please encrypt this for me. And the key is we're offloading the cryptography to Vault. So the actual encryption is happening you know, on the Vault side the application never sees the actual encryption keys, and it's not involved with making sure that it's getting the cryptography correct, right? Then building on top of that, you can do things like data tokenization, right? So if I'm getting a credit card number and my downstream system expects to get something that looks like a credit card number, I don't want to necessarily give it an encrypted value in a different format. So this lets me preserve the format by tokenizing it and returning a different value. That value is now not sensitive, right? I can put that in a database, pass it between different systems, only Vault can then detokenize it to return the original credit card number. And then the last one is using Vault as an external key manager for other software. So you might connect your different databases, your message queues, systems like storage or vSphere to Vault, and Vault can be the key manager for it to do the underlying encryption. Right? So all of these fall into the advanced data protection use case. And all of that is now available as part of HCP Vault as well. So taking a step back, when we think about the full life cycle of a secret, right, there's obviously the storage of the secrets, the rotation, the management of the life cycle. That's kind of classic Vault you know, that we just talked about. Solutions like HCP Vault, Vault Self-Manage, Vault Secrets all solve that problem. Then you have data protection and tokenization, right? data that doesn't go into Vault, but Vault is helping us secure it, encrypt it, protect it. But I think the common question we often got was, okay, but how do I find my secrets to begin with? Right? Like, it's great when I know that they're in Vault, but what about when I don't know where they are? Right? They're all over my estate. They're in GitHub. They're in Jira. They're in Bitbucket. Right? They're you know, in my ServiceNow environment. So how do I find these secrets to begin with? Right? Earlier this year, we announced the acquisition of a company called Blue Bracket, which built a product to solve exactly that, a secret scanning product. It lets you scan your estate, find these secrets, and build an inventory of it. So today, I'm super excited to announce that we're bringing that to market as HCP Vault Radar. So let's take a quick look at what this actually looks like. So as part of HCP, you'll be able to log in and get into the radar service. And you can see the dashboard basically right away is going to surface up everything that we've detected. Different types of secrets, which repositories they're in, what type of credentials, the severity of those things. And then we can drill into the specific repositories that we've connected to where we're detecting an issue. So in this repository, we found some critical, medium, and low severity issues. And then from there, you can get sort of a prioritized list. So we can say, here's all the secrets we've discovered. Here's the different criticality of these things. And then we can actually use this to drill all the way down to where that secret is being defined. So here we can go all the way through, and we can see in GitHub, our developer has committed and hard-coded a new secret value. 
you know, obviously we want to go have a conversation and tell them to stop doing that, right? And I'm sure none of us have ever seen this happen uh, in the real world. And so, you know, the long-term vision of this is ultimately we want to be able to integrate the detection workflow directly into the management workflow. So not only do we want to detect this, but then help onboard those secrets directly into Vault. So that way we are not only telling developers, hey, please don't do this, but here's your path as to how to resolve this issue, right? And that way we can connect the life cycle from discovering these secrets all the way to putting them into Vault and managing their life cycle. So this is now in early access. If you're interested in giving us feedback and playing with it, uh, please join uh, and sign up for that, and then we will bring this to market early next year. So three key things, HCP Vault Secrets, go play with it today, available now. Advanced Data Protection, also available as part of HCP, previously was only in self-managed. And Radar, if you're interested and want to give us feedback, please sign up. Now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about Boundary. Boundary is our approach to user-based access. So if we think about Vault as really machine-to-machine -machine or system-to-system, -system, Boundary is the flip side of that. How do my human users get access to a database, to SSH into a VM, to talk to any sort of a privileged internal system? And really looking at it through the lens of how do we do it in a modern identity-based, cloud-based way? So if we think about what the workflow is for us, it starts by the user authenticating using an existing identity. I don't want to have a set of SSH PEM files or VPN certificates or other usernames and passwords. I want them to single sign on using an existing identity. Next, I want to define a set of rules. What is that user and group allowed to access in a logical way? And what I mean by that is I want to say, my set of developers have access to this set of named services, right? my web tier, my database app, you know, my, you know, who knows, my logging system. But I don't want to talk about it in terms of IP addresses because my infrastructure is too dynamic, right? I have apps running in containers, they're scaling up and down, I'm redeploying things with infrastructure as code, so managing a set of static IPs is impractical, right? Then the next part of this is great. My user can now just select what do I have access to. I want to connect to the database or I want to connect to SSH to a particular machine. But the user fundamentally is never on the network. So unlike a VPN or unlike a bastion host where we're bridging users into our network, which then potentially opens us up to you know, moving laterally east-west, you know, and I think we've seen this in a number of occasions, it could be non-malicious on the user's part. You know, they're just on corporate VPN. They open an email they shouldn't have. And now you have malware that's moving east-west through a network because they've been bridged into production. So the key here is the users fundamentally never have direct network access. right? Instead, Boundary is going to connect them automatically directly to the endpoint as a reverse proxy and potentially fetch the credentials needed from that from Vault. So the user might not ever see the SSH credential or the database credential. That's just injected automatically, right? So we've been receiving some really great feedback, and it's exactly what we want to hear from early adopters. Mantech is a large federal system integrator, obviously very focused on the transition to zero trust. And for them, what they shared is this allowed them to bring a DevOps approach to how they were doing access management, leveraging infrastructure as code for how they configure it, and using credential injection so their developers never see the SSH keys used to get into production environments. Very similar feedback from EQ Bank. Obviously, as a bank and financial institution, very security sensitive. And for them, looking at for a modern cloud-based PAM solution and the value of being able to integrate Boundary of Vault meant that they could use the just-in-time credentials to move to a dynamic model rather than having static credentials for their environment. So we've been very busy with Boundary as well. Lots of great updates, and you're going to hear more later as part of the conference. The one thing I want to highlight, and this has been really great to see, is we've brought an embedded terminal or an integrated terminal directly as part of the, the product experience. So rather than have to establish a session where you're SSHing or connecting to a database and then have to switch out of Boundary and go to a terminal separately, it's all integrated now, so it's a streamlined workflow where you can basically push the button and immediately be in the environment, debugging, running queries, doing whatever you need to do. So super excited about some of the UX improvements. <laughs> Next, I want to talk about console. So when we talk about console, it's filling in the networking challenge around how do we bring an identity-based approach to networking. And what I mean by that is historically, we always thought about networking in terms of you know, IPs and hosts. But in a much more dynamic world, that starts to break down. I want to think about the identity of my service and say, great, application foo is talking to application bar. 
How do they discover one another in a dynamic way as they're scaling up and down? How do I automate updates to things like firewalls, load balancers, API gateways that might sit in between foo and bar? How do I secure that interaction by defining policy based on the identity of the app rather than the IP? And then how do I enable global scale? So console solves a lot of different challenges. There's a bunch of things we've brought to it. Some of these, I think, are uh, you know, things like multi-port services that have been long requested, so super excited for that. Lots of great extensions around Envoy to be able to enable richer things. So I'm not going to highlight all of these, but I want to talk about one that I'm particularly excited about, which is locality-aware routing. With locality non-aware routing, you know, I think what we sort of classically see is I might deploy two services, A and B, and they're talking to each other. And for availability reasons, I've deployed them across multiple availability zones. Right? So kind of a classic pattern, the apps are sort of split between you know, A, B, and C availability zone. And I think in naive traffic patterns, what you would see is it's basically an even split. Right? When A is talking to B, sort of round robining between all services of B. And so you're getting a rough 25% split across those various services. Now that's fine, except the challenge ends up being is because we're going over this availability zone boundary, A, we're taking added latency because we're leaving our availability zone, but B, we're adding a lot of cost. Right? There's an additional penalty from our networking bill as we go between these boundaries. Right? So with 1.17 of console, we're bringing what we're calling locality aware routing. So it's great to have multiple availability zones in the case of a failure, but most of the time we're not in a failure mode. So if we're not in a failure mode, can we actually optimize the routing and keep traffic within the availability zone when we don't need to go outside of it? So this would allow us to say, great, the traffic is actually split between the instances within my availability zone. That allows me to improve my latency, but more importantly, reduce my cost. And then if something goes wrong, great, console can fail us over to one of the other availability zones. So for some of our largest customers, they estimate their saving to be on the order of millions of dollars a year just on their networking improvement of this. So super excited for this to be rolled out as part of console 1.17. Next, I want to talk about HCP console central. You might have previously heard of us talk about this as the management plane for HCP console. And so the goal has really been how do we provide a single management layer atop of multiple console clusters? These might be self-managed. You're running them in your own data center or your own cloud. They might be HashiCorp managed as part of HCP console. But we want to have a single integration layer where we can provide richer capabilities on top of it in terms of how you orchestrate, how you manage, how you debug, how you operate these clusters. So HCP Console Central is really a parent, an umbrella, for multiple different sets of capabilities. And I kind of want to highlight three of them that are available now. The first is an observability set of capabilities. So whether it's a cloud-managed console or it's a self-managed console, now when you log into Console Central, you can actually get real-time telemetry and visibility about the health of your console cluster, the services running within it, telemetry of traffic running between various services. So this makes it a lot easier for developers to quickly understand, hey, is my service up and running? Is there anomalies in how traffic is flowing here? And quickly be able to debug various networking issues. At the same time, what we've heard from folks is, great, we love this idea of being able to link our self-managed clusters, but we don't necessarily want Console Central to be able to make modifications to configuration or change things. So one of the capabilities we've brought is a read-only link capability. So if you have self-managed clusters, that you want to link to Console Central, but you don't want us to be able to modify anything, now there's a read-only linkage mode that allows you to give us a limited set of permissions and still benefit from things like observability without necessarily bringing some of the other capabilities. The last one is what we're referring to as the HCP Console Global APIs. So what this allows you to do is basically have a single integration surface area for maybe I have multiple console clusters for development, testing, staging, production. Maybe I'm spanning multiple different regions. Maybe I have cloud managed, self managed. But now I have one set of APIs that I can expose things like where are all my services? What's their current health? How do I integrate those into downstream automation? This gives me a single public SaaS set of APIs that I can hit. And then we can sort of transparently make the right API calls and bring and surface all that relevant data through a consistent set of management APIs. So super excited about all of these capabilities that are now available through HCP Console Central. So Console 1.17, available now. Like I said, locality or routing is probably the highlight, but a lot of other great enhancements there. So you'll learn more at, the, at other sessions. And then HCP Console Central, available through HCP today as well. So that takes us through the set of security announcements 
Now I want to flip over and spend a little bit more time on some of the infrastructure products. We're not going to touch on everything, but we will touch on Terraform, Waypoint, Nomad, and Packer. So starting off, I want to talk about Nomad. Nomad, <laughs> I, heard a, I heard a shout out over here. <laughs> Uh, Nomad, you know, for us has always been a focus on two really big things. One is simplicity, right? Uh, you know, I think there's certainly other solutions in the market that uh, have a lot of conceptual overhead. I think with Nomad, the goal has always been how do we keep it really simple, right? It's a very few number of nouns and verbs that you have to know as a platform operator, as a developer, to really get going with it. At the same time, we don't want that simplicity to sacrifice its ability to operate at scale. Uh, in fact, what I love to hear is we you know, heard of a user just this quarter that they had a 22,000 node cluster, never talked to us. They're like, it just works fine. We're just running it. Uh, and that's what I love to hear, right, is that we're seeing these environments that run at absolutely massive scales uh, because Nomad scales incredibly well. And so we've been super, super busy uh, in Nomad land. Lots of really great announcements and updates over the, you know, the latest two versions. But I want to highlight a few key ones that I think are, are really interesting. The first is workload identity, right? So I think this is a pattern that we've seen emerge and we're trying to bring across more of our products, which is how do we actually simplify integration between Nomad and third-party systems by having a first-class notion of workload identity? So when you enable workload identity, the Nomad servers will actually provide a signed JWT token to each of the allocations, each of the tasks running on top of Nomad that gives it a cryptographic way to assert its identity. That token can then be used with an external system, in this case, let's say Vault, where we can configure the JWT backend so that that client can authenticate against Vault in a seamless way. This means we don't have to have pre-shared tokens and shared secrets and things like that. The client gets an identity, it uses its identity to log into Vault, and we establish a three-leg trust relationship by pre-configuring the keys that are trusted between Vault and the Nomad servers. Now this pattern, of course, is meant to be used with systems like Vault, but it's meant to be used with all sorts of third-party systems, right? That means it could be used for console, as an example. So when we talk about the previous integrations between console and Nomad, it required more of a pre-shared token type model, where now we can use workload identity to do this in a much more seamless and dynamic way. It's not meant only for HashiCorp products, so we can use the exact same thing, for example, to authenticate against cloud providers. So our workload can actually get a dynamic IAM credential by using a federated identity. So I think this is a very powerful pattern. It simplifies the integration and security workflows between Nomad applications and third-party systems. Another capability I'm super excited about is we've introduced a notion of what we call node pools. So you can imagine if I have a 22,000 node Nomad cluster, I might want to segment you know, the subset of nodes that are used for different workloads. Right? I don't necessarily want all of those nodes to be used in a general purpose way. So node pools allow us to group subsets of that capacity and give them sort of names, roles, and access control around them, right? So a simple example might be I have a set of GPU-based nodes that I'm doing different AI and ML workloads on. Those might live in their own pool. I don't want to, by default, schedule workloads onto them because they're more expensive and I'm using them for specialized workload. So I have a default set of nodes that are my more general purpose. And then I might have a bursting set of nodes, an auto-scaling set of nodes that are going out into cloud. So these might be three different node pools, and then I might use access control to say which teams have access to what. My ML team might need the GPU and default nodes, while my app dev teams might use the default and the burstable nodes. So this gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of how we want to manage capacity in a multi-tenant service, right? At the same time, as part of Nomad 1.7, we're bringing NUMA support, non-uniform memory access. So this really helps for some of these sophisticated ML type workloads where we're running on very beefy hardware and we want to be able to leverage NUMA and be NUMA aware for the scheduling. So what does this actually look like? Here we have a simple example of a Nomad job. We're going to define an AWS command line that's just downloading a file from S3. And then we're going to serve up this file with a simple Python web server, right? So you can see here, great, we're just going to use the AWS CLI. We're going to download a file from S3. And here's our little Python script. It's just going to serve up that file, right? Very simple little job. Now, when we first run it, obviously, we get access denied. The job running doesn't have Amazon keys. It's not allowed to actually request that from Amazon. So now we're going to change our configuration and use the identity block. So now we're going to thread through and say, great, we're going to issue a named token for the demo. An audience is AWS. There's sort of a short time to live as part of this. And we're defining a set of AWS roles, 
so the ARNs that we want to assume, and then what's the identity file that we're going to use to authenticate with AWS, right? On the AWS side, we now need to configure that to say, okay, great, if you see that role, the AWS one, we're going to map it in and give it some permission to actually access this S3 bucket. So we're establishing a trust relationship on the other side. And now we can basically rerun. So we're going to redeploy this application. So now Nomad will schedule it, providing it that particular identity token. And now when we refresh, we can see, great, Nomad used its identity. It was able to authenticate against AWS, download the file, and we're serving our smiling Nomad face, right? And so that's really trying to showcase you know, how we can make these integrations way simpler. That Nomad job file now has no AWS key in it. There's no secret that was pre-shared. There was no keys that were pre-shared. All of this is done totally dynamically with short-lived and ephemeral set of identity tokens. Right? So super excited for that. So we covered a bunch of announcements. Some of those are already available today in Nomad 1.6. Some of these are upcoming in Nomad 1.7, and that will be available very shortly. So now I want to switch gears and talk about Terraform. Uh, Terraform almost goes without a need for introduction. I think uh, most people probably discover it uh, through you know, cloud provisioning, right? Starts off by, hey, I need to set up my Google or Azure or Amazon accounts. That tends to be where people start. From there, what we see is people start to apply it all over the place. So why can't I use it to manage my you know, networking configuration in a private data center? Why can't I set up my vSphere and OpenStack and on-premise environments or even bare metal? And then all the way up to high-level software as a service. So for example, with HashiCorp, we even manage our Okta environment and our Datadog environment and our GitHub environment, which are all SaaS as code using Terraform, right? And so these are all immensely popular use cases, and you can go see things like the Okta provider, which has 10 million downloads on the public registry. So as you can imagine, we've been incredibly busy uh, in the Terraform space. I'm certainly not even going to scratch the surface of some of these things, but I do want to highlight a bunch of really exciting announcements that we have coming. So first is when we think about kind of module testing in Terraform. You know, for a long time, there was no native way to actually do any sort of testing. So as module authors, we'd write these modules, our application teams would consume them. But if there was any issues with it, right, a user either misconfigured it, the module was poorly behaved, there was edge cases that weren't handled, you'd end up with the app basically breaking. And you know, now you have to go debug this thing because you know, there was an edge case that was not, not well tested. So we've seen this problem, and I think since basically the dawn of Terraform, there's been an ask for, OK, but how do we do better and more native testing? Uh, and so with Terraform 1.6, we added exactly that. We brought a native test framework. Terraform 1.6 was available uh, late last week. And so what this now allows us to do is, as part of our module definitions, we can define inline tests in a way that's native to Terraform, native to HCP, HCL. And now we can make sure that that behavior is well validated, well tested, so that our application developers have a great experience. Right? These modules are well tested, edge cases are handled, the behavior is as they expect. Right? In addition to that being part of the core Terraform definition, it's also a part of Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise. So as we explore the various modules, we can actually drill in and say, OK, great, I can see that there's multiple tests defined, but this module is actually failing its tests, right? So this can, get, you know, as we start building a shared set of internal modules, we also want to provide confidence to people that, yeah, great, not only are there tests, but they're all passing on a regular basis as well. So this is all part of how we provide that kind of day two, day three, full lifecycle management and manage this stuff at scale, because it's rarely one and done with a module. Now, obviously, no keynote would be complete without some discussion of AI. <laughs> so building on top of the testing work, what we've done is actually leverage some large language models to enable us to auto-generate those module tests on behalf of users. So when you submit a module to your private registry or your public registry, now you can actually leverage this capability to say, hey, please generate a set of module tests for me. So what we do is look across a bunch of other modules, a bunch of other tests that have had similar patterns, and based on sort of the comments and behavior you're trying to achieve, we can actually leverage LLMs to generate a set of tests in a few seconds. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. So here we have a module. We can basically push this button and say, please generate some tests for me. And a few seconds later, and a few million CPU cycles later, what we get back is a whole bunch of auto-generated tests, right? And so the goal here is, you know, again, 
it's AI driven, so you know, maybe it's 70% right. But it's how do we save you a bunch of time and at least get it 70% of the way there, and then you can fine tune these tests based on, you know, great. Actually, there's some additional edge cases and other usage patterns I want to cover as well. And I think this speaks a little bit to our general philosophy of how we want to approach AI, right? I think there is definitely a pattern of put a bird on it right now. Um, but we want to be really thoughtful in bringing these capabilities in a way that's really focused on how are we adding to the user's workflow? How are we unlocking productivity rather than just put a chatbot, right? And so you're going to see us add more capabilities like this over time. Now, I think one of the great use cases for LLM technology is auto generation of HCL configuration, right? And so you can already do a lot of that today with tools like OpenAI. I think the challenge is the hallucinations. So oftentimes it generates things that look like Terraform, uh, but aren't. And so how do you actually get better error messages and help debug this stuff? So a big focus area for us has been enhanced validation within an editor and giving really crisp feedback back to developers directly. So this is now part of the VS Code plugin so we can give very, very fine-grained and high-quality feedback on, hey, here's the error. Here's exactly what went wrong. And if you want to jump to the documentation, you can do that. So really looking at how do we make that authoring experience better, particularly as we start generating some of these tools that you know, may get things most of the way there. Now, shifting gears slightly, you know, one of the things we've always seen with Terraform is there's a need to do multiple workspaces as you get to more advanced configuration. Right? So if I take a relatively simplistic app, you might say I have an underlying infrastructure. Maybe I'm bringing up core networks, VPCs, et cetera. Then I have a Kubernetes app that's going to layer on top of that. And then I have three environments, right? dev, test, prod. In that sort of a very classic kind of a setup, I would have multiple configurations, one for my underlying, one for my Kubernetes app. I'd have multiple environments. And so this translates to many different workspaces. right? So I have workspaces for each of these configurations slash environment combinations. And now I have to orchestrate manually across all of this. I have to first run it across dev test prod, bring up my underlying infrastructure, then go and orchestrate the application deploy across all those things. So of course we can do this and we have users that have many thousands of workspaces and very complex topologies, but we constantly have been looking and saying, how can we make this better? How can we automate this more? How can we bring more awareness to Terraform of the fact that there's dependencies between all of these different workspaces? So what I'm super excited to preview for the first time today is what we're calling Terraform Stacks. And what Terraform Stacks does is bring a native understanding to Terraform of multiple component layers, multiple environments, and provide a single orchestration experience across all of it. This is the biggest enhancement to the Terraform orchestration engine since Terraform was released. And so what this lets us do is have a single configuration that spans multiple configs, right? Could be our underlying network config, as well as our Kubernetes app, and multiple environments, dev, test, prod, and capture all of that as a single stack. And so now when we interact with Terraform, it can actually do that orchestration across all those components and all those environments as part of a single workflow, rather than requiring you to stitch together sort of a workflow across multiple environments, multiple components. Now, this is meant to be a relatively simplistic example. The opportunities of what this solves is actually a bunch of different things that we've heard from users, right? One is, what if I have a very complicated set of dependencies between multiple layers of components? I want to bring up networks, storage, databases, different security layers, app layers, all at the same time. So I might have many, many different layers of components that are required to bring up. And great, we can orchestrate across all those. The other thing we've heard is, well, what about more complex environments? I don't necessarily just have a single production. I might have prod that spans multiple regions, US, EU, et cetera. And I might want to do staged rollouts across them in a phased way. I don't want to just big bang it into production. And so all of those things now become possible with Stacks. You can model these different deployments in as fine-grained a way as you want, as well as the components in as fine-grained a way as you want. And then the Stacks allow us to orchestrate across all of that. So I don't want to take too much thunder. Right after the keynote, you're going to hear from Harold, and he's going to do a deep dive on Stacks and some of the upcoming capabilities around it. But I'm super, super excited about this capability. Next, I want to talk about ephemeral workspaces. We announced this capability over summer, and I think the challenge we've seen over and over again is you have development and testing environments where resources are left running for way too long. Right? We brought something up for a CI run. It only needed to run for you know, a few hours, and then, oops, we forgot about it, and six months later, we're still paying for it. Right? Or Armand brought up his dev environment. He left the company. 
six months later, his dev environment's still running, right? And so you see these patterns over and over again, and a huge amount of this just turns into just wasted spend, right? And so the idea of ephemeral workspaces is now we can tag these different workspaces and basically auto-destroy them if they're not being used. So you might say, great, CI environment, it auto-destroys after 24 hours. Dev environment, auto-destroys after a week. And now you can actually manage that in a much more dynamic way. So super excited. This feature is now going generally available. It was announced over the summer in beta. Next, I want to do a quick refresher on Terraform no-code modules. This builds on top of the ability to define modules with Terraform, where you're encapsulating a set of patterns so that your developers don't have to know low-level Terraform, right? You don't have to interact at the kind of raw Terraform resource level. Instead, you can package up a higher-level pattern and then expose that out. And so a developer can come in and say, great, I want to consume this. No-code modules take that a little bit further by allowing you to not actually have to write Terraform. You can kind of point and click, as you just saw, through a UI. And underneath, it's actually templating the right Terraform and invoking those modules for you. But it makes it a little bit simpler. Now, I think one of the asks we've heard over and over, though, is, great, I have 5,000 developers in my org. 1,000 of them know Terraform. Should I train the other 4,000? Should they even have to know what Terraform is? Right? Or is there a higher level way that I can expose this where they don't even have to come in and understand what Terraform is? So we've heard this enough times, and we've spent a lot of time thinking about, OK, what's that higher level abstraction? How do we move away from necessarily even having to think about low level infrastructure? And we're super excited to sort of bring around the sort of reimagined HCP Waypoint. We introduced Waypoint about three years ago, looking at trying to solve exactly that problem, which is what's that divide between what the platform team is trying to deliver, which is a set of shared capabilities and abstraction over infrastructure, and what are developers trying to do, which is focus on their business logic, focus on developing new capabilities. They don't really care about the underlying details of how this stuff works, but they have to deal with it, and they have to debug it, and they have to be able to own some of it. And so there's this fundamental tension around how do you deliver a platform experience that doesn't turn into a black box? How do we enable developers without disempowering them to understand what's actually happening? And so we made one attempt at that with Waypoint a few years ago. I think the feedback we got was we didn't get the abstraction quite right. And so we've spent this year really listening to folks, reimagining it, rethinking it, and now really thinking about it as an internal developer platform with that explicit goal of enabling a set of golden patterns to be defined by our platform teams. They get exposed to our developers, as along with a set of golden workflows, but not delivering in a way that's a black box. Right? The developers want to be able to click through and understand what's happening when they need to debug something or go deeper. But they shouldn't have to know how it works at a very deep level just to deploy an app, do a build, do a rollback, execute the sort of day-to-day -day set of golden workflows. So what we want to empower is the platform teams to define these patterns, these workflows, and then developers to consume them easily and to keep it as open as, as a system as possible. So what does it actually look like? Well, if I'm a platform engineer, what I want to do is define those set of patterns. I might write infrastructure as code and put it in my version control system. I'm going to capture that as a set of modules in Terraform. So these are reusable, either if someone wants to point and click using it as a no-code module, or they want to consume it as infrastructure as code in an automated way. Great. These become repeatable patterns. And then I can express that as a golden pattern that gets exposed through Waypoint for developers who don't want to know how the infrastructure works, who maybe don't know what Terraform is. Right? And so now as an app developer, I can come to Waypoint and say, great, I want to just consume these golden patterns. I can come in and just say, great, I want to create a new application. What is the set of patterns I have to choose from? I can come in and basically just select one of these, hit go, and have that actually orchestrated for me. Right? So this leverages infrastructure as code under the hood. These are all Terraform modules, but it allows us to abstract and hide it from the developers who then get to just focus on the pattern and workflow. Right? So I'm super excited about this. It's really an evolution of how we're thinking about HCP Waypoint and moving towards developing that set of sort of internal developer platform. So we have a whole bunch of stuff that we've announced around Terraform. Stacks, I'm hugely excited about. Stay tuned. You're going to hear more right after this. Testing as part of the latest release, enhancements, the editor validation, ephemeral workspaces, and tight integration with HCP Waypoint. You know, throughout the entire keynote, we've had a whole bunch of different announcements. You know, and I think the, ultimately our goal is how are we delivering a set of end-to-end -end workflows? Right? Each of these, as I talked about, solves a different task. It's a different piece of the puzzle. But really, at the end of the day, it's about delivering an application end-to-end. -end, right? And that needs infrastructure. It needs secrets. It needs all of these other pieces. It needs networking and service discovery. So what I really want to show is how does all this kind of come together 
and work. So I want to do a live demo of exactly that. Uh, and so I want to invite two people who actually know what they're doing uh, rather than me. And so I want to welcome Kyle and Rosemary onto the stage who are going to do a live demo of all of these pieces end to end. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> oh, this is Super fun. excited to have you here. Thank you so much. So my understanding is you've been working as part of our platform team to make this super easy for our developer team to actually be able to deploy and deliver applications relatively quickly. I think I gave you at least, you know, I don't know, 20 minutes to prep for this demo. So. 20 minutes? <laughs> 20 I just minutes. found out. Did you find out? No, oh. I, you told me five minutes. So. Oh, oh, great. All right, well, everybody, yeah. wish us luck here. Well, and they're the brave souls that wanted to do a live demo, so I'm going to exit the stage in case anything goes badly. <laughs> so if you don't see me for the rest of the conference, you know exactly why. But I appreciate the brave souls who volunteer to actually do this. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, Rosemary can always blame you as the platform engineer. Yes, so, you know, this if it doesn't work, true. it's really not, your, not really, really her fault. And you know, next time, maybe Rosemary could give me the heads up that it's the keynote demo. Well, that you was, know. That was I, not involved I, in our, our it discussion. It a little bit more exciting. I had one that. minute's notice. There's only so fast I can type. <laughs> All right. I think we're good. OK, you, well, you I'm going to go grab, grab a coffee, coffee break. So I'll yeah. see you guys in a little bit. And if I don't see you, then best of luck. OK. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Armand. Wow. <laughs> That was a very nice show of faith there in the exit. I know, right? All right, hello, so I'm a platform engineer. And I'm a developer who just needs my application deployed for you know who. I don't have to wait on the ticketing process to get a database, a GitHub repo, or deploy my app, right? Like, I don't have time for that. So, you know, we actually have a new developer platform that you might have just heard about. Want to give it a shot? Sure. Where do I start? Excellent, so let's start by heading out to HCP opening up Waypoint, and just creating a project from a template. Then go ahead and choose the application that you want, give it a name, and that'll kick off the entire process. Great, but these only call out my repository. Where's my database? So you can actually go ahead and also provision your database by clicking into the add-on section and just installing exactly whatever you need to help support your project. All right, nice. So we're, we're probably running out of time here by a little bit. Um, so you can check out what's happening behind the scenes by heading out to Terraform, to, by clicking on the Terraform workspace there and checking on the status of the actual Terraform run. That's pretty cool. It looks like it's using a no-code module or something. How do I know that this module's OK? So by clicking on that link that you went to right there, you can go out to our own private registry from the platform team that we published. So you know that it's using the everything that we designed it to do. Uh, and it's doing exactly what we intended it to do by using our testing framework that we just heard about. Uh, Kyle, it looks like your tests for this module are broken for the last commit. You might want to take a look at that. Well, you know, you probably caught me trying to get a little too fancy with the regex. Not exactly my forte. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and check back in on your workspaces here. Sounds good. OK, it looks like my URL is available. So let's take a look at that. All right. I'm supposed to have some secrets or something in here, right? Now, so ordinarily, we would wait and you know, pause, but time is a luxury right now. Uh, so let's jump into HCP Vault Secrets and start the se secret sync process. So just click into your app, and then hit the integrations, and then start the sync for your intended repo. Nice. Let's check. I hope they're there, Kyle. Are you saying that you don't trust the platform team? I mean, never mind, never mind, don't, don't answer that. Let's, let, let, let's just wait for the secrets to show up, and then uh, as soon as they, they hit, let's, uh, let's check in on the status of your app. All right, well, I'm going to wait on them. It looks like they're not synchronizing right now. But I feel like I need to check on my database more. This can run later. OK, that's fine. So by that, we, get, we also have a very nice capability to log directly into the database that you provisioned as part of the add-ons by heading out to actually Boundary, where you can use the integrated terminal to jump right into that database that you deployed to start hydrating your, your data. Nice. So I can even use this integrated terminal to log into the database however I want to, right? Absolutely. Nice. All right. Well, this is pretty awesome. I mean, I think I have most of everything that I need to get started. I mean, I can just update my repository and push, right? So what do I have to do next? 
Uh, let's see. Let, let's go head on out to HCP console to see if we have a, uh, an updated status on the services that are running behind the scenes. All right, let's check. We gotta scroll through all of these tabs. For you have so many tabs. I'm sorry, you know, I keep opening everything and I'm hoping that, oh look, there's my service, it's up and running. Well, I guess I haven't issued any requests to it yet so I don't see any metrics, but it's nice to know that it's healthy and it's ready for you, me to update. Exactly. All right, I think this is good enough. Let me, uh, let me commit everything, push, and uh, I'll let you know if I run into any other issues. All right, so let me go ahead and message our, I mean, you know who, that the demo's ready uh, so that he can come back out, out on stage and uh, we can tell him the good news. Well, thank you both so much for bringing the brave souls who opted to do this. Appreciate it. Next time we'll give you more than maybe 20 minutes heads up. Thanks. And we'll have to talk about some of the, you know, rough edges in this, yeah. you know, platform team. We'll have a discussion later. So <laughs> lots, thank you lots so of much. Training. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Thank you, Rosemary and Kyle. Awesome. And I swear to God, this was their idea. I was opposed to live demos, but they did an awesome job. So lastly, I wanna talk about HashiCorp Developer, right? We brought this together over the last few years, really bringing all of the HashiCorp documentation, learn guides, tutorials, and sort of API references into one portal. And I'm sure many of you have interacted with it. If you go to developer.hashicorp.com, you'll find all of our different content there. And so we've really looked at how do we make it a smooth experience as people are learning the products, as they're getting certified on different things, as they're trying to do cross-product integration. And so again, no keynote will be complete without a second reference to AI. <laughs> and so this is where we focused on how do we make some of this go a little further. Oftentimes what we hear is people ask very specific questions. Hey, how do I do this very particular thing? And it's often not easy to find exactly the right piece of documentation. So this is where we've worked on the developer AI that's integrated directly to DevDot. So you can ask it questions like, yeah, how do I actually configure a Terraform no-code module? I saw it in the demo, looks cool. And so what you'll get is a, an answer back that basically synthesizes a bunch of our different tutorials and documentation, gives you a concise answer, and then links to some of the underlying documentation if you want to drill in further. So super excited about this. As we've been kicking around the early preview of it, it actually saves you a lot of time over searching and trying to have to stitch together two or three different pieces of documentation. So super excited about this, just making it a lot simpler, especially as you look at some of the more advanced workflow pieces. Right? So that is now available in preview as well, so feel free to sign up for that and we're happy to give you access. We'd love to get your feedback on what we can do to better refine that. And so to wrap it up, you know, I think we've had a lot of announcements across the entire portfolio. Obviously, we didn't get to talk about all the new features, all the new capabilities, all of the product updates, but we have a great set of talks lined up for the rest of today, rest of tomorrow, so please stay tuned for all of that as well as we have even more that is streaming virtually that it will be available uh, that you know, isn't in person as well. And so with that, I will hand it back to RMCs, but thank you so much for joining uh, for HashiConf. Thank you. Thank you.